and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Oh, do I have a fun episode for you today. It's been a while since we've done an episode swap with another show, and today we are mixing it up by having a fun and engaging conversation with a fellow podcaster and conservationist in a completely different part of the world. In today's conversation, I'm sitting down with Diblex Lesalon, creator and host of the Boots on the Ground podcast based in Kenya, Africa. Diblex and I have a thoughtful conversation about conservation in Kenya and the United States, the state of podcasts in America and Africa, how and why both of our shows came to be, the struggles we've had to overcome to get to where we are today, and what we hope to see in the future for both conservation in our home countries and our shows. I learned so much from Dblex about what's really happening in Kenya regarding wildlife conservation and what his community is doing to empower local people and protect wildlife. Get ready for lots of laughs, stories, science, and feelings of hope. All right, everyone, please enjoy my conversation with Dblex. Well, hi, Dblex. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited to sit down with you right now. This is going to be such a fun episode. I absolutely know it will. Your fellow podcaster just happened to be on the opposite side of the world. And I'm so excited to learn more about you and conservation in Kenya and how your show came to be. So first, I just gave a little sneak peek to everybody about who you are. And and please just Tell all of us, what is your story and how did you get to today? Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Brooke, for inviting me. Such a pleasure to be here today and uh, to speak with you and connect with your listeners on that side and uh, do this. You know, I'm so excited. I'm so humble also. Uh, you know, my name is, maybe just to do an introduction, my name is Diblex Lesalon. I'm born in Kenya in a small town called Narok. It's, it's near the Maasai Mara. so. There were lots, lots of, and lots of wildlife when I was growing up, you know, and going to school out there. Uh, we did school trips. Sometimes my parents would take me for, for holidays in the Mara uh, to just connect with the people and the wildlife. And my interest for tourism really grew from an early age in school. Uh, so I, 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 I did my schooling in Narok. I went to boarding school and later on in, in university, I found myself in, um, in Strathmore University where I, I pursued a, a bachelor's degree in, in tourism management, something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, so over the years, I've been so fortunate to, to hold various positions in the tourism and hospitality industry in Kenya. And my last one, I was working in the Mara for Asilia Kenya as a relief camp administrator. Thank you. Oh, that's so wonderful. Okay, okay, okay. We're not done yet. So <laughs> how, so, okay, so you're working in the tourism industry here. And which ironically, I was too, before my show came to be too. So how in the world did an idea for a podcast come to be? Like, how did Boots on the Ground evolve or show up or come to me good question good question we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic are hit uh, you know in 2020 and um, taking you back uh, during that time I was working as a reservations officer for a company here in Nairobi called the Safari and Conservation Company and in March borders were shut all of a sudden the president put in strict measures for people not to move and uh, we were in total lockdown so i figured i can't stay in nairobi i can't pay my rent here i don't have money coming in so what what will i do so i went back to Naro, my home and um i spent time with my parents you know helping out here and there but on my free time i was really reading a lot and listening to podcasts because i love listening to podcasts, podcasters such as Brené Brown, you know, Simon Sinek, to name a few, and some other local podcasts, which I was really into that time. So, yeah, I sat down and I realized, wow, there are no podcasts for travel. And uh, I looked up and uh, there was nothing really. And um, after my research, I, I realized that uh, this is a great opportunity for me to, to start my podcast. I was really 
you know, uh, not sure how that will go down to be, but I was excited, you know, I talked to my parents about it. They supported me with purchasing the little equipment that I needed to start it out. And I, 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 I designed my own uh, logo, you know, and uh, I, I figured out which is the best hosting platform and boom, we started the, I started, sorry, the local travel local podcast, basically that period my mission was to encourage local people to travel local to support local to buy local eat local so that these businesses can survive you know and uh, move forward because uh, um, the tourism industry was paralyzed and uh, it was bad you know all of us were sent home uh, it was really bad millions of people had lost their jobs so the first episode i did with my friend my best friend called felix on the banks of uh, river sagana really a really perfect place for adventure here in kenya in central kenya in kirinyaga and uh yeah we i rolled it out like that i continued you know doing episodes and i figured wow i'm i'm, I'm good at uh, interviewing people i like listening to people's stories why why can't i why can't I bring, bring, start bringing in some guests? And the first series that I did was Women in Travel. And it was a very interesting series, which opened my eyes and gave me that boost, you know, to keep on going and to, to push for this. Uh, I hosted uh, around four women. And after that, I realized this, these people not only, do, do not only travel. Some of them travel to make a difference, to support girls, to empower women in the local communities, the local Maasai women who have for a long time, you know, been marginalized and they are not given opportunity to, to, to go and, uh, you know, get a good education. You know, some women who are doing travel for purpose, you know, traveling for purpose, you know, meaningful travel. And these are the stories that I really wanted to reflect. And that. After that series, more and more guests, I started searching for more and more guests. I did another series called About Saving Our Rhinos. I, I collaborated with some very good people. And it, now that is when I started, you know, this conservation thing, which I'm really passionate about. And to take you back a bit, I did my fourth year project in Namunya Conservancy in Samburu. It's a, it's a wild, wild it's, it's one of the wildest places in, in Kenya, actually, the northern Kenya. And it was a Tretati Elephant Sanctuary that my love for conservation and nature was cemented. And, you know, now that I was talking to these people, fast forward, you know, doing the Rhino series, I, I got really excited to hear stories of, of, of positive change, to hear uh, like a story of uh, one James Mwenda, who was the caretaker of uh, the last northern white rhino, the male a northern white rhino Sudan, which died in 2018. And he narrated how he was there during the last moments of Sudan's death. And it, it really touched my heart, you know. And these are the stories I wanted to reflect. These are men and women who have, you know, taken their time, you know, to be on the ground, to put their hands in the mud for conservation to work, for local communities to thrive. And um, Fast forward in 2021, around February, I figured, wow, maybe it might be time to, to rebrand. And that's how Boots on the Ground podcast was, uh, was born. The rebrand was, was really great, you know, and that is how I, I, I'm, I am here, you know, still podcasting, still spreading the message, still inspiring people and uh, changing the image for conservation in Africa as, as a whole. Thank you. And like we connected, so I'll just give a little backstory on how me and Deblex met. So one, we had already been interacting on social media, of course, on Instagram, because that's just what we do is like, I want to support other people, other podcasters, other people in conservation. And so you and I had already been interacting, having absolutely no, like, no clue that this would come to be. And then one of my colleagues was at the, a camp that you were working at. And then you just, you two happened to chat. And then, yeah. oh my gosh, like, oh, okay. Like you definitely need to talk to Brooke. You know, she has this podcast, Cardiology. You guys need to connect. And then she looked it up and realized that we were already talking and connecting with each other. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, Kelly, you're phenomenal. And then ever since then, we've been talking about putting this episode together and, and just learning more about your podcast. Because I, I love it. I love what you've done. And just the name itself just speaks volumes. It's called Boots on the Ground. Like, Exactly. It's the people that are doing the hard work every single day that are getting up and actually the ones making the change. And it's very rare that those stories are the one that gets out. You know, we don't yeah, hear from sure. them. And so that's, you know, that's, sure. the, that's the motivation behind Rewatology too. So 
Yeah, we were like cut from the same cloth. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how uh, Ruidology came to be. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like your story, but the exact opposite, if that makes any sense. So I went to school, I went uh, for a hardcore science background. So I went, I studied zoology at the Ohio State University. And then I went and studied conservation biology for my master's. And my big passion are big cats. So I, I love pretty much all of them around the world. I don't have a favorite one. And just ask me on what day of the week and I'll tell you which cat is my favorite for the day. And yeah. so they have been, they were been my really, really big passion. And as I, so I was coming at this from a science side. And I, as I was going through more and more of the literature and also too, at the time I was working in zoos where I was interacting a lot with people. And the more I, learned about people and the more I read the scientific literature I realized that oh my gosh the only way we're going to save our wildlife and our wild places and our predators is if people care how can I make people care and one of the best ways that I found especially for conflict-ridden species like our cats and our other big megafauna of any kind is through yeah. conservation tourism and so when I discovered that, that is when I'm like, OK, this is what I'm going to dedicate my professional career to It's going to be conservation tourism because it checks all of the boxes. You know, it brings income to people that need it most that, you know, so instead of using natural resources, they are actually protecting it because people are coming in and bringing money to keep that area pristine and intact. So yeah. and then, you know, you're giving people an unbelievable experience. They absolutely love the wildlife more. They're more inclined to then do philanthropic things afterwards because they've been so moved by the experience. So it's just overall a net positive when it's run correctly. So I was like, OK, this is what I'm going to send. I'm just going to dedicate my career to this. And so I switched gears out of the zoo world and I had traveled the world a couple of times by this point through my master's. So I had already experienced all this myself. And I got a job at this great company called Natural Habitat Adventures. And I worked the, for them for years and I had put everything into my career there. I just all of my identity, like everything. Like this is going to be where I was at for the rest of my life until all the other things that I'm about to say happened, you know, classic. But also just as a little thing that I did there is every single month for about two years, I hosted these things called conservation coffee talks where the last Friday of the month or whatever it was, I would bring in somebody from the conservation community or and or in inside the organization to talk about usually a pretty controversial topic, which was very enlightening because, you know, nothing was there was no rules. It was we learned so much from these people. And then March 2020 came and we all know what that coincides with. And so <laughs> me and a lot of my colleagues, actually my entire department, we were brought into a room and we were like, we're sorry, but all of you have lost your job. And after that, <laughs> of course, there was no jobs in tourism and there was no jobs in conservation. So I was like, well, OK, I got to put on my big girl pants and go get another job and something because, you know, I still have bills to pay. So I worked for a startup. And this was the first time that I had been around people that were around my age that were creating something that didn't exist before. And there was there was no such thing as a higher up telling them no, because they were the bosses like they were. And I never been around that mindset before where just people that are just super motivated, like they are creating something that doesn't exist. And so just being around that and then also not being in conservation anymore, there was this big hole in my heart. Like I put all of my identity into that job. All of my contacts, everything was in that role. So when it was taken away from me, I was I was really lost for a while. And then it yeah. was about a year that I was at that company. And then I started to the, the seeds for this podcast really started to plant and be planted and grow. And then the final push was I watched that documentary by David Attenborough where it talked about his life's witness statement. And oh my God, I got insanely emotional and I'm not an emotional person. Like I, I'm really <laughs> good at saying level head. I don't cry. I probably should cry more than I do, honestly. Like, but I was so upset during this and I just looked at my husband and I said, what am I doing? What am I doing? I have to, I have to start the show. 
I have to start it. I just I just need to. And so then the next day I reached out to my boss. I was like, hey, I'm going to go down to part time and I'm going to figure out how to put this show together. So and then the next few months, I learned how to build a podcast, like what that meant. I'm a scientist, like I'm a conservation (laughs) biologist. I'm not an audio engineer. I'm not a journalist. I just happen to be good with people and I love listening to stories. So and I just learned all the tech stuff. I started to get things, the gear that I needed. And then January 2021, I launched and the show has officially reached 100 episodes now. January, this upcoming January will be two years that it's been live. And wow. yeah, it's just it's been it's been absolutely phenomenal. Finally, giving having a platform where people in our field can share who they really are like they're not just a name on a on a scientific literature review paper they're not just a name at a nonprofit. like you are a real person with a real story and I want to hear why you do what you do because the only thing that keeps us going half the time is passion and so what is what is my guest's passion why are they doing what they're doing and they are the heroes they are the unsung heroes that don't get the notoriety they don't have documentaries made about them you know they rarely even have an article about their really important work that's going on because they're saving this one little bird (laughs) species that happens to be a keystone in this one ecosystem somewhere and they're so (laughs) passionate about it but they don't get the notoriety that they deserve and then also traveling so much i've met so many amazing people And I'm like, and we'll be around a campfire. Like, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We'll be at a sundowner or or, uh, just just having a beer, a Tusker, like we were just talking about over Mm -hmm. something in a dinner. And and they're telling me their life story. And I'm like, why am I the only person hearing this? You need your story out into as many people as possible to hear what you're doing and can be so inspired by your story. So all of that combined it's 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 a why it's a why not only for me because i feel like i'm contributing so much to conservation but also it's it's for everybody else it's for my community it's for all of these beautiful voices that i've had the honor of meeting over the years wow. <laughs> oh my God. i love i love love it so much wow that i love your perspective and just taking you back on what you've just said, you know, how it's all started, making people to understand and care about conservation, about wildlife, about why are we, why do we want to do this, you know, at the first place? Because when people take ownership and when people care, that is when the magic happens, when they feel like they have, you know, been um, included in the decision making you know, in, um, in running these initiatives uh, on the ground or at the local level, that is where the magic happens. And it's interesting to also note that you, you did not have any background in, um, None. In, in technology or anything, but you learned these things on, you know, you learned on the job. And uh, it's so encouraging to other young people out there who want to start a podcast, who have an amazing, amazing idea that they want to change the world that they want to share to the world and uh, it's really encouraging that you can start that you can do it you can do it with what you have and these are the stories that we really want stories of hope uh, stories that really encourage people to to do to do and just do brooke i'm so amazed i'm so happy and i love your perspective on that and uh, maybe brooke uh, maybe you can take us through the state of podcasting in the united states of america i'm sure it's big it's been there for a very long time it's a, it's a billion dollar industry, if I'm not wrong, because here in Africa, what I can say is uh, it's, it's the COVID-19 pandemic. It's one of the silver linings of the pandemic that we saw a lot of podcast mushroom. And it was in, in these moments that we were locked down, we were in our houses, that we wanted to connect to other people. And that connection was through Zoom, through webinars, through podcasts just listening to what people are saying, just listening to people's stories. And I am so happy that people came out, myself included. We, we were brave enough, you know, to make our voices heard, and we continue to do so. And I'm so happy also to, to state that Spotify, uh, you know, launched for the first time in Kenya last year. And oh, this really? year they have a fund. Yeah, this year they have a fund. They supported 13 podcasts in Africa, you know, and four 
out of those who are in Kenya. And uh, it's really encouraging to see them come here and support uh, content creators, you know, push their content forward and make our African voices heard. And Africa Podfest, we also have Africa Podfest, a festival for all African pod podcasters, uh, which is happening also in... Um, in February of the next year on the 12th. So it's really exciting to see all these people come together, you know, different, sharing different topics and just getting the conversation going, just keeping it going. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh my gosh, I had no clue. That is so exciting. And also one of the reasons why I wanted to connect with your show so much is because there aren't really that many shows coming out of Africa and it's beautiful what you've done. And so that's another big reason why I really wanted to chat down with you too, because it's the exact opposite situation in the United States, you know, being the, the home ground essentially of where podcasts were really born and have been sprouted out of. And so it is pretty cutthroat here. It's, it's the, everybody, it feels like everybody and their brother and sister and mother and grandmother and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> everybody is starting a podcast and it's almost like a running joke here. It's like, oh yeah, you have a podcast too. And while I, it's almost come like almost like a joke, but at the same time, it is seriously so valuable. Even if somebody only does a show for like, 10 episodes or not even that much at least you tried like you put it together you know to put something like this together isn't just just you know speaking into a microphone like you have like an entire thing that you have to put together like this is a show and then you have to build it yourself it's like it's like starting for anybody who hasn't done something like this it's like starting your own business like you're like you're a solopreneur or, or maybe you have a yeah. co-host or something where you're doing this on your own and so yeah it's it's very saturated, but at the same time, not really, especially in our particular field, which is the conservation podcast specifically, there's still so much room to grow. One of the reasons why, again, I built my show is it's what I was looking for and I never found it. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe there is a show out there that would have satisfied me and then I would have never built mine. So it's probably a good <laughs> yeah. thing I never found it. But it just didn't exist where it was all of these really just like PG, like very just dumb, dumbed down episodes about these concepts or or me being very into this field. And I know what's going on. I would hear these stories from people that weren't the whole truth like they, they weren't actually what was going on in the full picture or it was just somebody that was a PhD that just had to come on and talk about their work but it wasn't who they are as a person like anybody could have sat down and told that story and nobody would have known any different so that was a different angle that I wanted to approach because it was just this niche that in nature podcasting that I didn't find and it was the authentic stories from the people that were doing the work as like, you know, as your podcast says on the ground. Yes. And, and so that, that is what mine came out of. The show is doing relatively well, which is crazy still to this day. <laughs> I know that there is, so I, I'm actually based out of Colorado and podcast movement, which is one of the biggest podcast conferences or whatever you events you want to call it is actually going to be in Denver next year. Wow. And so I have not been to a podcast event yet because just now the world is starting to open and and being able to actually travel to things. So I, that'll be my first big event that I plan on going to. The show will be like two and a half years old by that point, which is really funny. Um, that'll be my oh. first event. But yeah, so there is still a lot of room for growth from what I've been able to gather. There's still a lot of voices that still need to be shared. Yes, there are a ton of shows already in existence and shows are having to evolve. Like, for example, YouTube is now the biggest podcast platform that there is so i've been putting a lot more effort into the youtube channel just in general uh, i don't exactly know how that's going to actually turn out because again i'm a scientist that's now a podcaster and i guess now i gotta be a youtuber we'll figure it out we'll figure it out what that means we'll get there we'll get there but yeah yeah sure, so, sure. so that's a big thing too is just like everything's going more video so yeah We'll see what happens in the next five, 10 years. I mean, your and my show might look completely different by that point, but that's fine. We can just, just change and evolve. Like right now, what we're doing is where podcasts are right now. 
And then we'll see what keeps evolving, going to these events, learning, you know, shows drop off, shows come on the come on, you know, more celebrities decide they need a podcast like Kim Kardashian has one now. I'm like, come on, girl. Like, you also need a podcast? <laughs> Jesus. But uh, as an example, <laughs> um, uh, don't get me started there. But yeah, so definitely still a growing industry there's still a lot of stories that need to be told it is very saturated in the u.s but i feel like because of that it's very cutthroat and you have to have good content or there's no way you'll survive so Um, there's that that's a good thing so i mean i'm sure my show is way better because of that but yeah so that's what it's like over here (laughs) (laughs) wow that's really interesting and what uh, maybe we share in common is a niche you know finding a niche you know, topic to cover. And one thing that I'm really proud of is I've, I've, stick, I've stuck, you know, to, to tourism and conservation, something that I'm really so passionate about, something that I started way back when I was a little boy, you know, and video podcasting, as you've mentioned, really big also. People are putting uh, their content there. I'm not so big on that front, but uh, we'll get there. We'll right. get there. <laughs> one step at a time. Like adding a video component, like people, like, just as a fun experiment, just sit down and think about producing a video, a produced video for YouTube right now, or even social media and just like think yeah. it through. And again, you and me are coming at this, you know, we're tourism specialists, we're conservationists, and we just happen yeah. to do this now. So there's a learning curve, but I know you and me will figure it out because that's just what we do, you know? <laughs> for sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Cool. What has surprised you the most uh, about wildlife conservation in the U.S.? You mentioned that you have a background on that front and you understand you've worked, you know, in zoos, you've traversed the country in so many uh, different areas. What has surprised you the most? What are the trends that are coming up, you know, that are shaping up wildlife conservation? Yeah, so this is two faceted. I have two answers to this. They're definitely correlated. So I think just from personally, my own personal experience, I thought that when I first went into this field, when I was 18, you know, just graduated high school and started my university career, that it was all going to be about wildlife. And so I focused hardcore about animal physiology, you know, let me just look organismal biology, like all of these really scientific in the book things. I thought that is how I was going to be a conservationist. And I realized that, no, that is absolutely not at all how it works, because nature and wildlife is phenomenal at being themselves. They have no problem being awesome in the wild. It's humans that have the problem. It is us that is making conservation a hard dealio. So I went into the field thinking that I was just going to go out into the bush. I was going to be with cheetahs like with you on the Mara, or I was going to be in Pantanal setting jaguars or or trying to trek mountain lions somewhere in the Rockies. I thought that was what conservation was going to be. And then the more I got into my career, I was like, no, not at all. It's actually 100% about people. Conservation is people management. It's not wildlife management. Wildlife is amazing at doing what it does. And right now, most of our field is working how it's figuring out how to flip what humans have done over the past, you know, however many centuries. And so going down that route. So the United States is, I think sometimes it's easy to forget how big the United States is and how much ecosystems and biodiversity that there is here and how many issues come along with that. And so I'm sure that if I was stationed or like my roots were somewhere else that I would have a different answer for you right now but one of the big things that is really exciting that is going on is there's a whole bunch of nonprofits mostly nonprofits mostly the private sector that is coming together to restore the American prairie so you know they say it's like the Serengeti of the of the Americas and it used to be this used to be true before European settlers came completely wiped out all the wildlife that was across the prairies And because of that, the ecosystem has degraded so much that, you you know, like I know that you focus a lot on climate change. That is a really big problem. And we're seeing, especially now that I live in the Rockies in the West, which is a much drier part of the United States. And a lot of people are moving there. So we have we're starting to have massive water management issues. And a lot of that is because the land is degraded. 
And one of my upcoming guests is going to be very exciting. He's actually going to talk about a lot of this stuff. So I really can't wait to learn from him. To talk more about water in the West and the issues that are around that. But with that, rewilding the prairie is a big, big topic right now. Um, so the American Prairie is actually a nonprofit. They're doing a lot. So one of the big ways that this is happening um, and that the Nature Conservancy does. So if anybody's heard of that nonprofit is buying land or giving credits of some sort in order for the land to be restored to its to restore to whatever the restoration level needs to be. It is very rare. I mean, sometimes it's possible to restore it to its pre human disturbance stage, but that's really hard to do. It's almost impossible in a lot of places. So restoring it to some sort of wild version of what it was. So a lot of, you know, trophic rewilding. I actually just talked about this on an episode that is bringing back your megafauna. So that's bringing back usually like an apex predator to the area, a keystone species um, or your mega herbivore. So like that's bringing back bison. That's bringing back your prairie dogs, which is like a little rodent that they are a keystone species that a lot of other ones really depend on. Um, that's bringing back your wolves. That's bringing back all of these other animals that are really integral in, in putting the ecosystem back together. So that is probably that that's the closest one to home to me because I live right yeah. beside the American Prairie. And also being in tourism, we are partnering with some organizations to then monetize that land that they are now protecting through tourism. So that is one of the big reasons why I do what I do is because we get to bring people there. They are absolutely moved by these amazing experiences. They're seeing bison, burrowing owls, bobcats, <laughs> all of these beautiful species that they didn't even know existed there. And also the wow. land is being protected as it's being restored. Yeah. Um, That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what happens in like the next 10 years as this, as this particular big swath of land, you know, the bison herds used to be millions upon millions strong and there's very few wild bison herds even left. And so that is a really big initiative like this Saturday. So we're recording on November 4th. This Saturday is actually National Bison Day. And I found some wow. really cool scientific papers that I'm going to do a couple of <laughs> videos on just to talk about why it's important to bring bison back and our big herbivores like, you know, and, and your part of the world that those are your giraffe. Those are your elephants. Those are your big herds that you've luckily through the way your community works, like in, in Africa, you've been able to keep. And so a lot of the ecosystem services are still there because everything is still intact. intact. They're still intact. They're yes. still intact, which is great. And so like the Mara and the Serengeti, that whole ecosystem, it's like it's like a shining light for the rest of the world of what the world can be again. And so that is one of the big things I'm looking for. I mean, of course, there's other things along the coast that are um, a lot of just protected areas that are now in our waterways that used to not be there. So those are a lot of big things. I'm really, like I said, I'm really curious to see what happens with water. That is going to be a big, well, it already is a big conservation issue pretty much all over the world. But that is a big one that is developing pretty hardcore in the United States is, is how are our water, like, what are we going to do about our water? Exactly. I like, I like what you said about uh, when you started the people management, you know, conservation is about people. And uh, what, what is happening in Kenya, for example, is, you know, Conservation cannot work without the involvement of local indigenous people, you know, who for millennia have lived, you know, with this wildlife. And one thing that has really surprised me, and it's, it's, it's a disruption in the tourism and conservation sector, is the mushrooming of awareness campaigns, you know. And one of the guests that I interviewed the other day is called Jim Justice Nyamu, who works for elephants. Imagine covering kilometers and kilometers, you know, with local people, with children in school, with both the NGOs and the, the government representatives to just create awareness, you know, about our elephants. And another thing is uh, filming. A lot of films and storytellers are coming into play. Like, for example, The Elephant Queen, which is a big film. I'd urge our listeners to check out for that. There's another one called Kasigao to do with red plus carbon projects, you know, and podcasting like us who are on the forefront also to just spread this awareness and make sure everybody is on board. So that is really interesting. And people have to be aware that there is risk, that uh, we are losing species, that our elephants are, are being uh, poached, you know, our rhinos, you know, our, our lions are facing, uh, you know, a habitat loss. And this 
through films, I'm sure uh, we will be able to engage even the young audience. Africa has a very youthful population, like Kenya especially, very youthful population that is growing up also. We want them to grow up understanding the benefit, the economic value of having an elephant in a park. So these are some of the things that we are getting there. I, I was very fortunate to be part of a fellowship program by African Wildlife Foundation and Jackson Wild. We were like 21 fellows and six out of that cohort were selected to do films in the Mara about conservation, about uh, reformed cultures and what they are doing, turning the story, uh, flipping the coin and supporting conservation. And these are the stories of hope. These are the stories that we need to put forward and for conservation to work. So it's really interesting for, for our filmmakers, for our storytellers to change the image of Africa and to, to spearhead change on that front through films and filmmaking. Yeah, and I would love to continue to going down this path. Again, since I work for a safari company that one of our camps actually happens to not be far from where you worked or where you grew up. I want to ask somebody that is there, what is going on? Like, I've heard so much about cattle. I've heard so much about this, 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 and this, and this. But I'm not there. I have literally no clue. So could you maybe tell us some, like, just kind of how I did. Like, could you just maybe, what are some of the big issues that is being either ironed out right now or it isn't and is still a really big problem or... What what is actually happening in your country right now? Good question. Good question. A lot of wildlife, 65% is found in communal lands. And when you talk about this, we are talking about uh, elephants, you know, big, big animals, like even lions, which are roaming free in uh, near community areas. And human wildlife conflict is huge. Uh, we have lost a lot of cattle. We have lost even lives, you know, and uh, farmers, you know, who live just adjacent to the protected areas who grow their, their small produce for, for, for to sustain their livelihoods, you know, have lost these crops. And in retaliation, they go after these elephants. So human wildlife conflict is huge. And these are some of the issues that we're grappling with as a people. In fact, there was a video which went viral. Around um, June this year, tourists were in a park and um, there was this boy who was uh, herding his cattle inside uh, the park, which is illegal. I'm not sure whether it was a conservancy or it was, it, it was in the reserve, but there was this lion that was feasting on, on one cattle. And uh, this boy came running with a spear, you know, wanting to, to kill this lion. And the tourists were like, no, don't do this. Don't go there. This is a lion. And they were busy taking pictures. So you see that image alone shows you where we are. Yeah? I'm happy that the local governments, you know, local NGOs, even international are coming up with measures, you know, to, to educate and to ensure that the community benefits. You know, when the community get incentives out of, uh, of conservation, they will support the initiatives. If they are employed and properly paid, properly equipped, you know, and properly engaged in conservation issues, then they will take part. Climate change is huge, group. You know, this is something that is the world is disturbing the world over. Africa contributes almost 2.8% of global emissions. We are developing nations. The developed nations do this a lot. And us, we are we are the least emitters, but we suffer the consequences most. In Kenya, we have had the worst drought in 50 years. These couple of months have been really hard. Kettles are dying. People are dying of hunger. Our elephants, our wildlife, our zebras, all those, name them, they are dying in the parks. Even the other day, I was watching television with my dad at home, and our cabinet secretary, you know, was spearheading that uh, initiative of taking, transporting water from Nairobi to the national parks using Bowser's, you know. That situation, the situation is dire, and climate change is, is really disrupting everything like agriculture which you are big on you know wildlife tourism which you are big on drought yeah it's affecting it's affecting our livelihood so climate change is one thing that is of a concern and i'm happy cop 27 is beginning in uh, two days in egypt and i hope the, the the parties that come together to formulate these policies and to drive change will will do something good and we'll we will reap uh, you know, something better, you know, funds 
to to help us in adaptation you know to reduce the loss and damage in, you know with nest so these are some of the things that we are grappling with another one which is big is also habitat loss Africa is developing and uh, people are uh, having families and um, the population is is growing rapidly. And uh, in 2050, it is estimated that we will reach double figures. And uh, when people are many, you know, when the population is growing, we need water, we need food, we need houses, we need electricity. And where is this going to come from? So you'll find that uh, a lot of these development projects that are set up also interfere with the ecosystem. For example, um, there was this, uh, the railway, the SGR railway, which is passing inside the Nairobi National Park. And if you are aware, Nairobi City is the only city in the world with a national park adjacent to it. So what will happen to this wildlife, you know? Yeah. These are some of the decisions that we have to go back to the drawing board and think. Yes, we are developing. Yes, our people need these resources. But how can we do this in a sustainable way? How can we ensure that both sides win? How can we balance the needs of people and nature? So this is something that I'm sure it's in the minds of very many policymakers and very many people in, involved in conservation and tourism in this country and in Africa. And I hope to influence change and policy and to, to ensure that we talk about these issues and action is taken on the ground, really. Yeah, and when I, when I was listening to your story, I had a question that came to mind. And just from your own personal experience, so you grew up outside of the Mara and you know, you've been in Kenya and then also you were in tourism. So there's, there's few people that will understand conservation like you do. So could you maybe just share with me, how has maybe the relationship with conservation changed or the relationship with wildlife changed throughout your life history as you've grown up where you grew up and then now like now to today, how has things maybe, maybe what was it like when you were little and is that different than what it is now? Did you have a lot of conflict that your community ran into with lions and leopards and hyenas and all this other deadly stuff that you happen to live beside, which is crazy? Yeah, just how has it changed over your years of um, your life? I can say it's changing for the better because, uh, as I said before, we have lived with this wildlife for decades, for millennia. We have coexisted with these species. And um, maybe something that really is not okay, does not sit well with me, is the, the Western conservation model, which was uh, based in. Uh, in colonialism era, you know. So after we got independence and we started, we have come to protect our parks really well because this is things, these are things we knew. This wildlife we lived with, we, we coexisted with really well. So when I was growing up, there was plenty, plenty of wild game. Even when uh, on the roads, you could, even when you are coming from Narok to Nairobi, you could meet a lot of giraffe a lot of gazelles on the road, and uh, this has changed. Fast forward 10, 15 years uh, now, you're seeing a lot of uh, shops being built, a lot of roads being built, a lot of people encroaching the parks. So yes, the population is growing, people are developing, people need resources to, to live and to sustain and to, to move on with their lives. But there's also this other side of things where we want to keep this wildlife. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is our heritage. So there's a lot of efforts that are coming in left, right, and center to ensure that our wildlife are safe, that our local communities survive and thrive, that their livelihoods are maintained, that the culture, you know, and heritage of us Kenyans and Africa at large is protected and is, is, is changed, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. And then to continue down <laughs> this path, so then what are, what are some of the solutions to all of this and, and like what you're seeing? And this might be a good time too, if you want to plug any of your past amazing guests that really inspired you, like, like what, what's, where do we go from here? Like we know where we are today. We have our goal in the future, whatever that might be. How do we get from point A to point B? Okay, great. You know, we, we, we are talking about issues to do with poaching, you know, habitat loss how to balance development and the needs of nature and not to interfere with, with all of this. 
And uh, what we need most, and some of the solutions that we, we really are advocating for right now is local financing. You know, we need to move away from international donors, you know, and uh, start supporting conservation here as Africans, you know, and tell the story, the conservation story, how we know it, how we believe it should be, you know. So local financing is huge. Um, there was this conference in Kigali called the Africa Protected Areas Con Congress, uh, which happened, I think, sometime in June this year. Some of the issues that they talked about is, is financing. How can we ensure that we support our own, that we, we bring financial solutions to conservation and grow it from here? So awareness creation is also big. Uh, we need to, to tell these stories, to spread awareness, to educate more people, more young people about these issues so that we can understand what it means to us. So, yeah, that is something that we are looking for. And reclaiming, reclaiming uh, stolen land because uh, there's a lot of greedy people out here and corruption is big. Corruption is big, I'm sure. How can we ensure that protected areas are protected well? The rangers are equipped to man these places that stony, stony land is reclaimed for to opening up corridors and ensuring that all these places, all these wild places remain as they were intact, you know, for us to continue the conservation journey that we have always, we have always done. So who's the who here? Who are some, maybe some of your guests that you've interviewed that have really inspired you that seem to be at the forefront of really making this work happen? I would say Jim Justice Nyamu was one of them. Uh, he's someone who has covered over 18,000 kilometers, you know, walking for elephants and uh, spreading awareness on that front. And he's an amazing guy. Another one is James Mwenda, who was involved in rhino conservation in Nanyuki, in Olpegeta Conservancy, protecting the the last new northern white rhinos, you know, far to energy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Science is also coming into play and we are seeing embryos being developed and that species could survive. But his story, how he, he was taking care of this rhino was really amazing. And he grew up there, he studied there and he went there, you know, to, to do that work, to spending time away from his family. You know, uh, that was so encouraging. Another woman I really admire, the, she's called Dorothy, and she works in um, Retetti Elephant Sanctuary, just taking care of the elephants there, of the calves uh, that are taken from the wild. You know, maybe the mother has died, the calf, you know, will, uh, will not survive, you know. So the, it's an elephant orphanage, so they take these elephants and they take care of them. Her story is a story of hope for many young women who want to go into conservation, you know. So that's, those are some of the guests that really inspired me. And uh, there are quite a lot. All these stories that I've done, I can't say uh, that one was better than this one. This one was, you know, all these stories <laughs> are amazing, are amazing. Oh, I know that exact feeling. Like, since I just recently released the 100th episode, and I'm like, everyone tell me what your favorite episode was. And I'm like, I hope no one asks me that question because I have mm. literally no clue. Just like some it's of them. It's a very hard one. It's so hard. Like this one was, yeah. I think, maybe my most philosophical. I laughed the most in this one or this one I learned mm. the most. Like, I, I don't know. I, every single episode I vividly remember and everybody's <laughs> doing incredible work. And I'm just like, I, I hope no one turns this question around on me because I won't be able to answer it. <laughs> Do you have one inspirational story from one of your guests maybe you could share with us? Oh, I should have thought about this. <laughs> um, the first one that comes to mind, this might not be like the most, it's just, again, it's, it's so hard. When one of them that really moved me is when I, so one of my first series that I did is I also do travel series and I've done a few now. And I went to Nepal and I sat down with a whole bunch of incredible conservationists all over Nepal. And this one gal, Bijou, oh, I hope she listens to this because I'm totally giving her a big <laughs> shout out right now. So she actually came and met us in Kathmandu and I had an opportunity to sit down with her. And she is pioneering or just like really leading the charge on. Um, so they have really big issues with uh, elephant conflict in their village. But there is no tourism. There is no nothing there to help mitigate or just, you know, help financially support people with living with this wildlife. And so that is one of her big missions is like 
she grew up petrified of elephants and and that for good reason like they they were just destroying their her little villages she grew up in and and so one of the big turning points for her that is she said that her mother looked at her and said that female elephant that mother elephant also has babies like she's also a mother too and she's just trying to feed her young like i am for you and so that was a big clicking point where the fear turned into admiration and love and so now she's uh, focused her whole entire career i think she's now i think maybe she's starting her phd i have to look up exactly where she's at in her in her career but she's also now working on protecting elephants and also finding a way for her specific community in nepal can live with elephants and so wow. i found that that story was super inspiring and and also that one was a little special because i actually got to sit down with her in person we she came to my uh, hotel that I was staying at in Kathmandu and we were able to sit down and do a fantastic interview. And she's just talking about her personal stories and, and how this turned from fear to love and how she's hoping to save essentially her community and, and the elephants that she works that, that lives with her and, and, and her life. So that might be one of them. Oh, I don't know. There's like so many episodes. Wow, uh, you've reminded me of one of my guests. Uh, she's called Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. She works in Uganda uh, in Bwindi Impenetrable Forest uh, with the gorillas. You know, she does amazing, amazing work. You know, she started as a vet. Now she, is, uh, she has her own organization called Conservation Through Public Health, uh, where they talk, where they do this amazing work of uh, ensuring that uh, these gorillas are safe and the communities also benefit and the health and the ecosystem of both the people and the wildlife is, 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 uh, is good. And her story is, was very inspirational. And she's set to release a book, actually, in, um, in December. I can't wait for that. I'll share that with our listeners for sure. And I think I might do another episode with her to catch up with the amazing, amazing work she's, she's done, you know, or with the gorillas. Oh, that's amazing. If she wants to be yeah. on more shows, let me know. <laughs> I'll just sit down with her too. I sure will. <laughs> I have not had gorillas on or Uganda. So one of my big goals mm. is to have somebody from every single country around the world, preferably someone that's local, if I can. Um, that, that's one of my big goals. I, I do have a lot of episodes that are pre-recorded right now that haven't been released. But once those are released, I'll be over 30 countries. But obviously, 30 is not the world. So I still yeah. have a lot of work to do. Um, but that is one of, my, one of my big goals for my show. It's a truly global show and get as many voices in places as possible. And so, okay, awesome. my next question. I'm very action-oriented. And meaning like we can sit and talk and have an incredible conversation, which of course we are right now. I'm having so much fun right now. But what is something that we can do? Meaning like I couldn't be further from you right now. I'm literally an entire ocean away, but I'm very passionate about your home and the the wildlife that you live with. What can someone like me or in Asia or Europe or and then also what can somebody do that maybe lives in Kenya, too? So both things. What can I do being a gazillion miles away and multiple plane rides? Or, and also what can somebody do that's right there with you? Like, how can we all help with, you know, Kenyan wildlife conservation? I think what we can do is uh, travel. Come to Kenya and experience the wildlife that is here. You know, that is where, that is when you will realize, wow, this is it. You know, we have to keep these animals. We have to conserve. We have to protect, you know. Uh, So I would urge someone listening to me across the, anywhere in the world right now to to just travel. Just uh, save up and just travel. And travel local. Travel local. Don't go to these big, big hotels. No. Go to our village, camp there, you know, spend time with the Maasai, spend time with the uh, Swahili people down on the coast, understand their culture, understand why they live the way they live, understand why for decades they've lived with these animals and uh, they are still surviving and, uh, you know, thriving. And share that story with the people. You know, when you travel, people take pictures, take videos, do interviews. So I will urge people to not only travel, but to share 
the Kenyan story, the Kenyanness that they experience here, <laughs> you know. So it's it's just travel, travel, support local tourism, support local businesses, support communities, and tell that story. Yeah, that's the only thing I can I can I can encourage people to do. Mm, I totally <laughs> yeah. agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. Mm. That's a big thing that I'm I'm a big advocate for. That's one of the big ethos of this show. And I also hope to start putting together some trips myself with the rewatology community. So well stay tuned for those. I, I kind of dropped them in the last episode I released that those are starting to come together. So Maybe we'll come meet you in Nairobi or somewhere in the Mara <laughs> duplex. That would be amazing. <laughs> sure, sure. Brooke, I'm curious to know, what are some of the struggles that you, you have come across along your journey as a podcaster, not only as a podcaster, but someone who has stayed in the industry for, for quite some years now? Yeah, so I think some of my biggest struggles is imposter syndrome really is real. And I've had it in multiple different facets because I have tried different, different careers in conservation, like being a woman, especially being I'm just like a tiny little woman. Like I've always felt like I had to prove myself in everything that I did and went above and beyond and everything that I did and not necessarily like anything bad in particular happened. Like there wasn't a moment where I felt like you know, like I was particularly attacked or something like that. Like none of that happened. Um, but I just always never, I, I just never felt like I was good enough. And then coming, uh, one of the big things that I had to overcome on this podcast is there's not that many women podcasters versus male podcasters. And so I've even come to find that like, there's some male podcasters that I know that are in my same niche that they just seem to just organically get more notoriety or more opportunities that come their way. And while I, I could get mad about all of this stuff, I, I could, I, I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and putting everything that I can into this and giving a platform for other women that they can bring their voices on as well. At first, when I was first building this show, I, it was only going to be women. But then I was, as the more and more I thought about it, I was like, well, that means that there's so many incredible voices that I couldn't share just because that person's gender is the opposite of what's on my show, which is like the complete wrong ethos. Like that's like the exact opposite of what I was going for. So I didn't end up just sharing women voices, but that is what I'm really, really passionate about is giving other women support. And because I know what it feels like, I know what it feels like you're not enough. I know what it feels like to be in the field and one, not know if you're going to be safe. And two, to know that the guy counterpart that you have in the field might not respect you as much, might not listen to what you have to say, even though you're just as intelligent, you took just as many courses, and then you're questioning yourself and whether or not you can do this. And for everyone listening, you can. I don't care what your gender is, like, you know, what you define yourself as. It doesn't matter. Like, you have the power within you. And you can get so many answers on YouTube. Oh my gosh, <laughs> YouTube and Google, you can learn almost anything and then just get out there and do it. And then there's just like a lot of other personal struggles that I just had to overcome and like my personal life. And I just, I just tell you what people, you just got to put, just like my dad says, and he has really instilled in me. It doesn't matter how you feel. If you have a job to do, you get up and you go do it. It doesn't matter what's going on in your personal life. Trust me, there's actually right now, there's some really big things going on in my personal life. And like, I'm not, I'm still sitting down and I'm still having this interview with you because I believe in this platform so much and it shouldn't suffer just because I'm going through something that is really hard personally. And so you just gotta, you just gotta put on your work boots. You gotta put, sometimes if you have to have a glass of wine at the end of the day, that is a-okay. <laughs> Or three glasses of wine. It happens. That is fine. But yeah, people people notice when you show up. And no matter what you're going through, people notice. So just keep showing up no matter what you're going through. If it's a really hard day, say maybe take some time for yourself. But all of us are going through something. You never know what that person is that you're talking to, what they might be experiencing in this very moment. And so maybe they're just really good at putting on a face. 
and I've become a professional at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but to flip that sure. around, I'm sure that you yeah. you have not had an easy journey as well. Tell yeah, us yeah, what are some things that you've it's overcome. It's not been easy, but maybe to just sum up what you've said is to urge people to just dress up, get up, dress up, and show up. You know, showing up is our power. At the end of the day, you know. We have to show up as our true self, as our real selves, and share our stories, you know. At the end of the day, that's what that counts. When I was starting out, it was, uh, wow, I was really confused. What equipment is best? Where to host my podcast? And um, along my journey, it's been this passion of wanting to share stories of people to drive positive change, even before the podcast thing. But this podcast, Boots on the Ground, has really, you know, given me that hope really to to just go for it you know mm -hmm. uh, but even before that it was i was doing things maybe i was half assing through some things that i was doing you know some roles some jobs uh, i was just doing it for for the paycheck maybe but as much as yes i was doing it for the paycheck but i was serving wholeheartedly at the same time but there was this void in me that i really wanted to talk to people and uh, you know hear their story and share their story and tell my story and learn throughout that process. So when I was starting the podcast, imposter syndrome, as you mentioned, I think everyone has it. For me, it was how will I sound? How will, will people like my podcast? You know, there are tons of podcast, podcasters out there. I don't have any mics. I don't have any, the best of the best equipments. Well, I only have a phone and my earphones. Wow, how is this going to turn out? How will I make money? You know, and maybe do this full time because um, I read, I did my research and I saw in the US and even in the UK overseas, podcasting is a billion dollar industry and people are getting mad paychecks, you know. For me, it was how, how can I get there, you know? Uh, who will support me, you know? Uh, what sponsors do I need to look out for, you know, to, to, to really push me forward and to... To, to help me share my story. So those are some of the challenges that uh, I have gone through. Of course, the internet, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, electricity also, you're in the middle of a recording and then boom, the internet is gone. Yep. And you're <laughs> like, wow, what did I do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> will I talk to this guest again? Oh, what will the guest think of me, you know, and my preparedness? <laughs> for this you know, you know uh, editing also has been an issue because i'm learning everything as a podcaster on the job you know i'm i'm, I'm everything I'm, I'm i'm a producer i'm the editor <laughs> i'm the marketer I, i'm the one who's going out to look for for guests you know it's crazy you know it it can you can if you don't take care of yourself and travel i love to travel so i travel sometimes you know i i hang out with my friends and my family if I do this the whole day for, for a month or for two months, I can go mad because it's everything, everything, setting up, you know, doing everything. But it's, it's really joyous and it brings me hope after I share a story and the feedback is positive, you know. After I talk to someone and I get inspired, after I talk to a local person and they tell me, wow, I went for it. I sacrificed. I did this and this and this to get where I am today. You know, these are some of the stories that really give me hope. So yeah, those are some of the challenges. Challenges are there, but you have, as you said, you have to get up and do it, you know. Let's get after it. So people, let's get after it. There's joy, There's, the view is, all, is always greater after the hardest climb, you know. So yeah, let's keep it going. And so what are your, I guess, two facets here? What are your, your personal goals or hopes for the future, maybe for your show or your career or anything like that? And then also maybe for Kenya and your wildlife, what do you hope to see personally? And then also the bigger picture in the future. Maybe I'll, I, I will start for my podcast. What I want for this podcast is to connect with like-minded people, to traverse every village in Africa. <laughs> every conservancy, every protected area, every community, uh, to talk to every community member and share their beautiful story, how they, they, have, they have been resilient. Even in the COVID times, there was this series I did in the Mara. I talked to some village women there and they told me how they were confused, you know, during the COVID times because their husbands will go away and not bring food, not bring anything. 
and the, the 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 kids had to go to school and it was it was a, a dire situation and they can't they can't farm because all they know is selling beads at the gate to tourists who come to the Mara. So I want to reflect these stories. I want to give these people hope and I want to drive this change. So people should expect a lot of changes and a lot of, uh, you know, great guests lined up for our audience, a little bit of an upgrade also with the equipment that I use also. Uh, a website maybe will come in handy too, you know, to be able to 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 connect with my listeners, to to do newsletters, to to do reviews and to and to connect with like-minded people across the globe. For wildlife, wow, it, it has always been work in progress and uh, conservation work and tourism and anything really. Uh, you can make a big step forward and two steps back. It's not for the faint-hearted and um, we cannot lose all hope right now. We cannot lose hope. We cannot afford to, to just let go of our parks and reserves and allow international connected cartels to come and poach our rhinos, to come and kill our elephants, to come and, and distort our values as Africans, as a people, to support their ill-willed actions of poaching and of selling this ivory that is believed to be, or this rhino horn, or these pangolin skills that are believed to be healing properties. I don't know, in Pakistan or those Asian countries, we need to spread awareness. So for me, my hope is more storytelling, I would like to, to connect with young people who are really passionate about storytelling, filming, podcasting, uh, to encourage them that it is doable. Let's spread awareness. Let's make our voices heard. Let's tell our story as Africans. Let's tell our conservation story and change the image of Africa. Because for a long time, we have always been viewed through the Western angle. But this is us coming and telling Wow, we, I've been living with lions. I've been living with wildlife. I've been uh, seeing uh, even uh, elephants when I'm going to school in the morning, in, in primary school. So wh what are you coming to tell me, you know? So it's, it's uh, more partnerships also. As much as we want this change to be spearheaded by ourselves, we need more partnerships along the sustainable development goals. Number 17 of them is partnership for the goals. We need to end poverty, you know? A lot of our people are suffering. A lot of our people are sleeping hungry. A lot of our children are not going to school. What are we going to do? We need conservation. We need our resources, our, our wildlife. We need to put an economic value to all these landscapes, resources that are beautiful and they surround us, you know, and to benefit our people. So that is what I'd want to see going, going forward. And I'm very happy that our current government is aware of these issues, mm -hmm. uh, climate change, uh, poaching, and they're doing all they can. I mean, support of our government, our local government, our county governments, all our, our leaders, our local NGOs and international. Let's come together and um, let's talk. Don't just talk, but let's do. Let's go to the ground. Let's support local NGOs. Let's support community-based organizations that are passionate, that want to drive change, that want to see our communities and our wildlife survive and thrive in Africa. Wow, <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> I feel so inspired. I'm kind of sweating a little bit. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah. Well, that was that was absolutely so inspiring. And I feel just honored to be just a little sounding board <laughs> A part of that, of course, like, again, professionally, I help bring people to the area to put more money there, but also having this platform where I can share a voice like yours, like that was so powerful. And I completely agree with you. I just complete, I just completely agree with you. And I, I'm really excited to see what happens. I know like that big election that happened recently. Um, yeah. And, and all kinds of stuff. So just to see this continue to progress forward and, and keep our keep your wildlife there and and everything so whew, that was wonderful sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure sure thank you and what what do you look to do in the next few months that maybe our listeners can um, pop an eye on and uh, connect and uh, see and support yeah so the next few months just keep on releasing really awesome episodes again there's going to be more countries around the world i actually haven't had kenya on so you will be my first kenyan episode which is wonderful yeah, yes yeah. you are you're coming in represent hot right now 
Uh, so we just continue <laughs> connecting with more and more people around the world. Again, one of the big goals when I put this show together was to have people from literally the entire world on. And I have so much more work to do. So continuing networking and just if anybody listening, like your voice needs to be heard, too. If you're working in a particular area that hasn't been on the show before, even if it has been on the show, it's fine. Well, I don't have your story on like more stories from more areas, especially Africa. And while I've had I've also I've had local Africans and then I've also had international people working in Africa on the show. Always one of my goal is to have the local voice. So, I mean, d like I'm excited to be connected with you now because I want more local voices on the show as well, because those, just like you said, are the ones that need to be told. And it's not just Africa. It's also, you know, indigenous people in the United States. It's also in, in Canada and Mexico, all across South America. It's everyone who has stake in what they hold dear to their heart. We need those voices on because I'm so tired of this one person that looks a certain way and they're representing the entire world, the entire field of conservation. And that's not the case. It's people. It's people who love their land. It is people that are traveling to these places to love the land and the wildlife. So those are what I want to keep on sharing and, and just getting out into the world. Um, next year, my travel list is going to start up again. Woo! So <laughs> hopefully more stories from around the world. One of our goals is uh, for me and D-Blex to actually meet up in Nairobi when I go to Africa yes. next year. So I'm, my goal is to actually make that happen. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been to Kenya, which is weird. I don't know how I have really? not been to Kenya. Uh, yeah, I've been like I've been <laughs> a lot of places. But I've not, I don't ask me how. It just hasn't happened. So we got to make it happen because I need to come to Kenya. Wow. And you do. Yes, I would love to see the Mara and just all these amazing places. And then, of course, you and me could do like a sundowner update episode, which would be awesome with a couple Tuskers in hand. That would be wonderful. So keep that on the radar. Um, that would, that's great. Again, one of my big goals was to actually put trips together to go meet these amazing guests that I have on. And it looks like 2023, those are going to start coming together. So I actually might be able to offer trips to the Rewildology community. And of course, if you're doing it with me, they don't have to worry about ev anything. It's going to be done the right way. Yes. Like we are going to do all the things that you just said, the local people, everything is just going to be the way tourism should be for the most net positive impact on the areas exactly. that we go to. And then, of course, people listening, you're going to meet the most incredible people because You'd have no way to meet these people otherwise. Like these are like yes. biologists or NGOs or whatever it might be. You know, you don't just Google them and, and have a tour with these people. So those are some really big things. Uh, the year is going to finish out strong again. A lot of just in new countries, new topics, new species, new issues. Yeah, they're all they're all on the docket. Ready to go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. And I'm, I'm glad we share the same kind of vision, you know, and uh, we have given our listeners a, a little bit of a secret that the real stories are, are there in the villages at the local community level, you know, and that is where we will be going. That is where we will be fetching our stories and bringing them, bringing them to you. As uh, maybe we look to wrap up this, uh, Brooke, any advice to our listeners? Yeah, I think that you and I had did a really good job just, you know, putting on your pants and just getting up and showing up. But also one of the things that I always love to say, too, is it doesn't matter what you do. You can help. You can contribute. What is your passion? Maybe you're an amazing artist. Maybe you I, I don't even know. Maybe you are a financial banker and you just care a lot about this topic. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to go to the links that you and I have, Dblex, to, to contribute to conservation. Everybody can help. You don't have to have a fancy title. Find your local nonprofit or local park or something that you're just really passionate about. Do you have a river by you that maybe there is a, you know, friends of that river organization that maybe you can volunteer with? Do you love birds? Our birds are having a really hard time. Can you set up camera traps around your property and, and see what wildlife is there and maybe partner with a local biologist? There is 
a million and ten, a gazillion ways to do conservation. And anybody can be a conservationist. It is not for a certain elite group of people. You don't have to have a whole bunch of letters behind your name to be considered a conservationist. It's a mindset. It is a way you do life. It is a way that you contribute positively to the planet. So it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter your professional career. It doesn't matter where you grew up or, or your resources. All of us can make the world better and do it. Just what, 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 how can you give your beautiful gifts to this world in a positive way for wildlife and nature? So that's mine. Wow. 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 That's big. That's big. Thank you for sharing that, Brooke. I share, I share your sentiments on, on a lot of things. And on that note, my little lone thing is podcasting. And um, just to share a story for, uh, for a great, great conservationist in Kenya who passed on and she won a Nobel Peace Prize. She's called Wangari Mathai, who fought for our forests here in Kenya. And she, she really faced a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles along the way, but she kept on keeping on. So my advice to our listeners, to our amazing, amazing listeners is be a hummingbird. Do the best that you can. Don't sit down. Don't be a spectator. Don't just tweet. <laughs> Go out there. Do make a difference. Make a difference in your own little way. It will count at the end of the day. So my advice is let's all be hummingbirds and let's, let's all do the best the best that we can. Well, on that note, I think that this was so much fun and absolutely perfect. And Flex, <laughs> I am so grateful that I now know you and I can consider you a part of my friend group of my conservation community here. So again, thank you for sitting down with me literally from across the globe. I know it's late for you. It's still like afternoon for me <laughs> and sharing your sure, beautiful sure. story and uh, the story of your country as well. So again, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Brooke. I can't wait to meet you in Kenya next year. That will be big. <laughs> We're going to come for you at the airport with the motorcades and with, <laughs> with all these people and give you a grand welcome. Oh. You, there's so much waiting for you here. This was fun. Very informative. I loved connecting with you and thank you so much for having me on this show today and for helping me share my story and hearing yours as well. Thank you so much. Asante, Asante Sana. Asante Sana. <laughs> Isn't Deplex such an awesome person? I'm absolutely serious about meeting up with him in Nairobi one day and you all are invited to join me. It's a dream of mine to enjoy a sundowner with all of you from the Rewildology community and an amazing guest like Deplex. <laughs> So if you're interested in possibly joining me whenever I head over to East Africa, please let me know by easily contacting the show at the website or DMing through your favorite social media app. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewildology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comments section of today's episode. Some of you have reached out and asked how you can support the show. Well, I'm happy to share that there are several ways to do so. Some zero cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at Rewildology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to the website and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. 
Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.